So hello everybody, um, welcome to the session. Um, this is a town hall meeting where we present the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, and we would like to talk about um, the importance of interoperability and the multi-stakeholder model of the IETF. My name is Mia Kuhlemann. I'm the chair of the IAB, the Internet Architecture Board, one of the two leadership groups in the IETF. Um, I will quickly, and this is why you're seeing some slides in front here, I will quickly go through like a handful of slides and give you some kind of the most important things about how the IETF works, a little bit also what we're doing, um, but very on a very high level. Um, and then afterwards, uh, we will have a little panel. We brought some of our leadership members um, here, so Colin, the IRTF chair, and Mallory is also an IB member, and we have four more leadership members online. Lars Eckert, the IETF chair, who unfortunately couldn't come here in person. Then uh, Suresh, another IAB member, um, Suresh Krishnan, uh, then um, Andrew Elston, the routing AD, and uh, Dhruv Dodi, another IAB member. However, uh, we will, they will also introduce themselves their self, uh, during the panel. And, um, and I will just quickly run through the slides and then I will hand over the discussion um, to Jane Coffin, who is moderating the panel. And I hope at the end we have a lot of time for you to ask questions. Okay, so this is also just, um, you see us here in person, but you know, so you can actually see the names and some of the acronyms I just uh, mentioned, and I will explain these acronyms a little bit in the next couple of slides. Again, I'm the chair of the Internet Architecture Board, Colin, the IRTF chair, and Mallory, an IAB member. And this one is probably more important um, if you are not lo locked into Zoom, um, so you also see the faces of the people online, Lars Eckert, the IETF chair, um, in Finland at the moment, I think, early morning. Andrew Alston, our writing, writing AD from uh, Kenya. Dhruv Dodi um, is based in India. And Suresh Krishnan from the US. So um, this is a, a short slide, which however has like some of the important messages about how the IETF works. Um, so very important point about the IETF is openness. Everybody can participate. And, and I think um, uh, we try to be really as open as possible so we don't have a membership fee. It's like everybody can just subscribe to any mailing list and enter the discussion at any point of time. Anybody come to, can come to a meeting. We have um, good online support for our meeting. And this openness is kind of in the heart, not only of our organization, but it's also something that is reflected on the internet because that is really one of the goals of the internet and we try to um, run the organization in the same way and openness also means not only everybody would be able um, to participate because um, um, there's no like we try to keep barriers for participation as low as possible um, it also means that the things we are producing the standards the protocols are free for use um, so there's no fee for like accessing our documents. They are all online and like, again, this is like the spirit of the internet where you just need to like implement the standard and then you are in the internet and you can participate. And that's also, I think, what has, has driven the success of the internet. Another thing to notice is really that we are a very technical organization. Our meet meetings are focused around solving technical problems, sometimes very, very detailed. And what we're trying to do is to make good t judgment on the technical level. And that's also um, why we can, we can uh, drive a consensus-driven process, because in a lot of cases, you can actually come to a compromise on the technical level and move forward, of course. Not everything, not 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 everything we discuss in the ITF is only technical. There are implications uh, that we need to be aware of. But our focus is really on doing good technical work that then gets adopted by companies because they get a value out of it and it improves the internet. And that's the other point. We are actually measure measuring our success. Did we good, do a good job based on kind of the voluntary deployment of our, our protocols? We, we cannot directly tell anybody to use our protocols or to like do a certain thing. But what we're trying to do is to do good technical work to make the protocols as reliable and secure as we can in order that they actually address the needs people have and they get deployed because they are good and they improve the internet. 
Um, this is the slide where I very quickly explained some of the acronyms I already mentioned. Um, so the, the um, IETF has actually two leadership groups. One is the Internet Engineering Steering Group, uh, and um, the IETF chair, Lars Ecker, is, um, st is chairing that group. And this is the group that is looking at the actual standard process. So they approve and review all standard documents, they manage the working groups, the meetings, and their goal is really to make the standards process as good as, and as productive as possible. And the other leadership group is the Internet Architecture Board. And the Internet Architecture Board um, has also some kind of admin roles. <laughs> there are little things we need to care about. Um, but as the name said, there's also a point about architecture oversight. And what that means is that we're trying to look at the work that's happening in the IETF at a more higher level. We're trying to understand are there any gaps that are important in order um, to like follow the principles that the internet is built on. Um, is there a discussion that doesn't have enough, enough, enough um, attention that we need to drive forward because there's an issue, um, these kind of things. And then at the same time, we also do outreach and liaison management. So we are basically the Office of Foreign Affairs of the IETF, if you want to put it that way. Um, and so we try to uh, talk to other SDOs whenever there's an overlap, but we also, and that's also why we're here, we're trying to look what happens in the rest of the world, what are the important topics that we need to consider and that may impact the internet and our standards work. And then I also would like to mention the IRTF. So this is the sister organization of the IETF. It's the Internet Research Task Force. They have a very similar structure. They also have research groups. They have different processes, but they are, in, in a sense, integrated in the IETF that like, we meet together in a common meeting. It's all integrated, and it's, it's very useful for two things. First, they look at the more long-term things. They look at the things that are not ready for standardization yet. They look at the things where um, you know, we see a trend that we need to keep an eye on. Um, and it's also good for actually providing um, more diverse input. So this is a way to get researchers into the IETF and get an exchange between engineers, researchers, and all the stakeholder and have, have a discussion. So I can just say from my own perspective, I've, I've started as a researcher in the IETF and, uh, and I could always provide some more neutral, <laughs> different kind of input and, and was well received in, in the discussion. So I think this is a very strong point about the IETF. ETF. Um, to, to give you a little bit of an idea, um, you know, what, like how big the IETF is, just a couple of numbers here, and like you can mo mostly read them yourself. We currently have 130 working groups. This is changing a little bit more, more or less. Like, for example, last year we created eight new working groups. We are closing some. We have some long-standing long working groups that are there for many years but take up new work all the time. So there's a lot of happening in the IETF. We are reaching the mark where we have nearly 10,000 RFCs. RFCs are our standard documents, um, but also RFC 1 goes back before the internet and before the IETF. Um, so at the moment, uh, or last year, we published nearly 200 new um, uh, standards documents or um, <coughs> documents that went through the standardization process. <coughs> Um, the participation numbers, uh, you know, actually depends on like kind of what what you th how you define participation, because there might be people who are only on mailing lists, there might be people who come uh, only to some of the meetings or all of the readings, people who write documents and whatever. And as we don't have a membership, we cannot give you like this one number. So depending on how you look at this, it's a couple of thousand people. Um, there's a lot of people who engage in discussions and who come to meetings to understand what we're doing, who might not be active authors or active, very active in the discussion. So, you know, it's the, the people who probably write the standards are in the range of whatever, um, two to three thousand, something, I, I don't know. <laughs> you can read the numbers here and make your own conclusions. Okay, this one, uh, this slide is a little bit crowded and I hope you can at least read some of it. Um, but the reason why it's crowded is because it has like a bunch of acronyms on it and I won't explain all of them. I might not even be able to explain all of them and you don't have to map all of them. It's more to like give you, give you a chance if you know some of the acronyms to figure out, you know, what the IATF, where to map it. Um, but uh, what you can get from this slide is that we are really working on maintaining, extending and um, developing the core protocols of the internet. So um, the, we don't do like the, the lower layer things. So uh, we don't do kind of any kind of radio um, 
or uh, Wi-Fi or radio messaging or whatever, or like Ethernet cable <laughs> standards and so on. And what we also don't do is like the very up layer, the application layer, the web itself, or the things where like the user actually interacts very concretely with an application, but kind of everything in between. So, and, and this is also how we organize ourselves. We organize ourselves a little bit in these layers to uh, make sure we can, we can uh, coordinate correctly. And so we have the application layer where you have, for example, the HTTP protocol, that's what your browser is using, but also the protocols that are used for video conferencing. Um, we have the transport, we have the routing, we have the internet um, area. So this is where IPv4 and IPv6 lives and get further um, developed, but also DNS, for example, a lot of the infrastructure stuff. And then we have two more important areas. We have an operation management area, and that area is also working on protocols to manage the routers on the internet, the devices on the internet, but it also provides um, guidance and best practices about all the other protocols when you deploy them. So that's why it's shown here on the side. And then of course there's security, and security is not a layer, security is a function that you need everywhere and you need to consider everywhere, so that is a very important part. And the people in the security area are very busy. Okay, um, I'm, I'm, I have two more slides. This one is also just to give you a grasp about what the IAB is doing, the Internet Architecture Board. Um, and as I said, we're trying to figure out what are more kind of high layer topics that might impact. And this is just a list of topics that have we've been discussing over the last, whatever, one or two years. There are also some references if you want to see some of the outputs. Um, not all of the discussion actually lead to documents or actions, but it leads to awareness. And you can see that like some of these topics here do map to discussions you have in this forum, like fragmentation, censorship, security, of course, and then governance on the slide as well. Um, so we're trying to um, engage with these discussions and, and, and understand and, and create awareness about these discussions. But I also would like to note that I think when we discuss this topic in the IETF, it's a different discussion than here, because we really try to understand how does it impact our protocols, how does it impact the technology, or the other way around, how does the technology impact these topics, uh, and how does it impact the internet architecture. And this is, this is my last slide, but I really wanted to talk about this point uh, a little bit more because it's very important, and it's openness. I was mentioning this at the beginning, and when I talk about openness, it's really two things. It's the openness of our standards. They are, they are available at no charge, which really fosters deployment and adoption of the standards. And it's really is kind of one of the keys for interoperability and why the internet has been so successful because all you need to do is really to kind of confirm to the standard, implement it, and then go and connect to the internet. And that's why we have a global network, because everybody relies on these standards and we can then talk to each other and create this one big network that we call the internet. And, um, and, and again, like the more of our, our work gets adopted on the internet, that's how we measure our success. Uh, and for like some of the things we are doing, we actually see uh, very good deployment. Sometimes it's really hard for us to measure that for us. Um, so uh, this is kind of also where the focus is. And then the other part is really um, openness about the process and like feel free to please ask later on any kind of questions you have about both of these things. Um, because um, I think like some of the aspects of the of the IETF work actually differently than other organizations, so maybe there's worth a discussion. So we really don't have a membership. Uh, everybody can come. We have three re meetings a year. Of course, you have to pay a fee for the meeting because the meeting itself <laughs> has cost, right? Yeah, you get um, you get we have the rooms and and all the things you need for a meeting. Um, but there's also ways to support people if they don't have the capabilities. Um, we we make. Our whole process is extremely transparent. We, we not only make um, the documents, our products at the end available for free, but also all the stages in between, everything on the mailing lists, um, all the meeting minutes, and we have our own tool which actually has an interface where you can get a lot of statistics about what's happening, and there's actually a bunch of re researchers who do really interesting work but trying to figure out you know, how the dynamics are. Um, and, and trying to figure out um, things about uh, um, you know driving forces and so on, on a, on a more objective basis. Um, also, uh, something that is a bit a little bit special for the ITF is that the whole decision making is based on rough consensus, um, and that means we don't have any kind of votings. 
And also, we don't have, it's not like the leadership that is deciding. The role of the leadership is to judge consensus, and the decisions are taken by the community. And the, way, the reason why we have rough consensus is because that means that we can also move forward without, uh, even if there, are, you know, if there are still concerns, which doesn't mean we are ignoring the concerns. We are, we are trying to discuss all the concerns, take them into account, but then if we, if we see that like we have an agreement between a, a good um, set of people who also want to deploy the protocol and move forward, um, then at some point we have to move forward and accept this roughness. Fortunately, we don't have a lot of roughness. I mean, like for some topics, for sure. <laughs> That's why we have the process. But in a lot of cases, we have very good consensus because um, we can get like agreement on the technical level. And um, that's where I want to stop. We have uh, the panel discussion coming up. We will go into like a little bit more into some of the aspects and I hand over to Jane. Thank you, Miria. Um, my name is Jane Coffin. I'm a co-chair of Gaia, which is one of the IRTF research groups, along with Curtis Heimrell. Um, I'm going to do some quick rounds of questions with um, all of the panelists. So it's Lars, Andrew, Shiresh, Colin, Miria, and Mallory. You each have one to two minutes to tell um, our guests here and the participants online how you've engaged with the IETF in the past and what are your current work areas of focus. I'm gonna start with Lars, go to Andrew, go to Shiresh, Colin, Mirya, and Mallory. So get your answers ready. Lars, you're up. Hi, good morning. Uh, I hope you guys can hear me. Okay, excellent. Um, hi, so my name is Lars Eckert and I, I chair the IETF as Mirya has said. Uh, greetings from Finland. Uh, it is uh, 717. I really wish I could have made it to Kyoto. I'm sorry that that wasn't possible. I hope I'll see you uh, next year. Um, I thought I'd give you sort of maybe a little bit of a personal uh, story so to make it a bit more sort of personal about how somebody would start in the IETF. So I, I was a PhD student and I worked on this thing called TCP, tra the Transmission Control Protocol. You, you might have heard of it. It carries most of the bytes on the internet still. And so we, we worked on it, we did research, we came up with an improvement. And then the question is, how do you actually get that improvement out there onto the internet? And so, you know, you, you start looking, you know, so where does TCP come from? And you quickly sort of Google at the, or at the time you used Lycos, I think is what we used. Um, and, and you quickly come out across the IETF and specifically there's a working group that works on this protocol, right? And so um, you figure out there's a mailing list and you, you figure out how to join the mailing list and then you send an email that says, hey, you know, we have this idea about an improvement to TCP. Um, what does the group think about this? And, and in our case, um, that, that change was sort of um, not uncontested, let's say, but the thing is, they're, they're, you know, the experts uh, participating typically in these groups. And so um, through these engagement, we actually realized there's a much better change that, that has a much broader um, impact and, and it has some, avoid some of the downsides. And so we revised our pro proposal and we discussed it. And eventually somebody said, you know, you should write this up so we can like, you know, put this forward towards publication. And then you learn about how you like format a document correctly so it can become an RFC and all of that. And then you also learn how does it get uh, processed through the process that Mia just described. And in the end, like there's an RFC. And then if you're lucky um, and then the, the change is actually good, implementers will pick it up and it'll get deployed. So that is sort of an example of, of some of my work that started to come to the IETF. And, and as Miria said, it is extremely open and it is just possible for individuals to start participating. Uh, we don't require a membership fee. We don't even require any sort of formal sign up. Um, so we have no notion of that. It is, um, you know, capable individuals that either come as individuals on their own time, or obviously a lot of our participants are sponsored in some way by companies or other organizations like universities uh, that sort of donate their time or their employer's time uh, to help improve the internet protocols. Um, and there was a slide that made us that was this hourglass uh, slide that talked about the different areas that we're working in. Um, I often come across people that sort of think, you know, the internet architecture has is stale and isn't changing. And, you know, we need to have this, you know, complete revamp of how the internet worked technically. Um, and that might be true if you look at the 10,000 foot level, because we still have protocols like IP and the DNS and TCP. But the, these protocols have evolved constantly over the three to four decades of, of the internet's existence. And all of them are very, very different than they were 10 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, or even two years ago in some cases. 
um, but the acronyms are still the same and, and they still fulfill more or less the same role in the architecture. And therefore it's, it's easy to sort of assume just because there's still a thing like the DNS, the domain name system, um, that you know the internet hasn't really evolved. When in, in reality, it's it's evolving all the time. So one analogy that that I sort of use is like you know we are basically um, maintaining an airplane airplane in flight, right? We're constantly changing everything about this airplane um, while it's up in the air, and we take great care that it doesn't crash. And that's why it looks like nothing's ever changing because the plane just keeps flying and keeps rising. Uh, but we're replacing you know the engines, we're replacing the landing gear, we're replacing the cabin interior. We're, replacing everything about this plane constantly. Um, and this is sort of the, the, the power of the IETF, right? Um, if, if you think about how, how would you actually do the technical standards for a global commons like the IETF, it needs to be done in a forum that is like the IETF, that is open where everybody can participate no matter where they're located or what time zone they're in or what their background is, if they have the technical competence and, and the interest and the time to help us out, uh, you know, they, they can very easily do that. Um, and and um, our executive director, Jay Daly, sort of uh, is often saying that, you know, if, if we didn't have the IETF, we, we couldn't invent it now, right? Because the IETF was born together with the internet and the way of designing the technical specifications really is unique in the world. And if you think about the IGF, right, multi-stakeholderism is a very important concept uh, that, the, that the IGF has. That actually probably originated with the IETF. Um, this whole concept that we need to have different stakeholders participating in the standards process is, is something that the IETF had already in the 80s and 90s of last, last century, because we had university people, we had the operators, we've had the equipment vendors, we've had you know various other constituents um, that that came to the IETF to discuss the technical problems that the internet had to make it grow better. Um, and and the IETF is a has a really unique role and is a really unique organization. And um, those of you who are uh, you know in a position to send engineers our way or participate as as non-engineer stakeholders, you know pl please do. We have a few upcoming meetings that will be in, in Prague in the Czech Republic in November. Um, we're going to be in Brisbane in Australia in March of 2024. Um, if I remember correctly, we're going to be in Vancouver uh, in the summer of next year, the northern summer, I should say, in July. Um, and my memory is hazy from then on out. Um, I hope we're going to get some questions. I'll uh, pass it on to the next person. Uh, thank you very much for your interest. Thank you, Lars. The next step is Andrew. Andrew, one to two minutes on um, what you're doing and, and where you're, what we can learn more about what you're participating in. Uh, thanks very much. Um, my name's Andrew Alston. Um, I am one of the three routing area directors, which means I basically handle the routing area um, and handle the standards coming out of the routing area is my primary responsibility in the IETF. The, when I first came to the IETF, it's actually, I think, illustrates a little bit about the multi-stakeholder approach. So I live in Africa. I live here in Kenya. I um, was originally from South Africa, but I've been in Kenya for about 12 years. And as we were developing things, I head up the R&D department for Liquid Telecom um, on the side of the world. And as we were developing things, we started to see that Firstly, we were facing certain challenges on the ground with regards to distances and other interesting issues that we find in running networks in Africa, um, as well as political changes which made us need certain things in the routing landscape that weren't really catered for. And so that's what brought me to the IETF originally. And I showed up and have never left. Um, but I came in there as an operator, and the one thing that I would say is that I, I do believe that operators, we, we need more operators at the IETF, because one of the things that I learned as I walked into the IETF is that if you want the internet 
to work in a way that works for you. You need to have your say. You've got to have your voice. And one of the things I spend quite a bit of time doing is trying to promote African participation in the IETF as well to try and grow the participation from the continent because we're sitting at the moment with 1.2 billion people on the continent, but the voices aren't participating. And the IETF gives people a place to come and to participate and have their say and make sure that the protocols that we are deploying on the continent are not just a retrofit from everywhere else. It's a consensus-driven approach where we can make our needs heard. And I think that's really important. So, yeah, I really hope to see a lot more operators, a lot more people at the IETF. And, yeah, thanks very much for having me. Thank you, Andrew. Shuresh, you're and so with that. Thank you. Hey, uh, my name is Suresh Krishnan. I'm an IAB member. And like my thing is similar to Andrew. So I started working on IPv6. So IPv6 was like a new technology, like in the late 90s, like an early 2000s. And kind of it was part of like a inclusivity issue, right? So if you look at the developed world, um, most of them had like a large blocks of IP addresses and countries like India and China were like really behind. We didn't have that many addresses to kind of go around and a lot of us started doing work on IPv6. And if you look at Japan, Japan was really leading the stuff. Um, Murai Sensei and Itajun San, they were like really ahead like of the whole world in, in doing the IPv6 stuff. So that's kind of where I started. When I went in, uh, like I thought like it will be this formidable thing and nobody would talk. And I kind of found the experience very similar to last that all these people you've seen in like the standards and in the books and everything, they were like all amazing people uh, totally willing to help out. So it was like a really nice experience to come in and come up with your problems and solve them like collaboratively with other people. So that kind of thread has kind of stuck around. And there's also been a lot of things that we've done like on the inclusivity front, like in the recent times. Uh, I think the remote participation is one, like, you know, we always had like good remote participation. It's really uh, ramped up quite a bit during the pandemic and that we continue it. And Nidia talked a little bit about uh, the waiver, so like we don't, we don't want to have like you know financial barriers for people to participate. So if you want to participate remotely and you're not able to afford it, like you know you can certainly get a waiver for that. Um, we have like you know for people coming to meetings, we have like childcare, so young parents can continue doing the work on that. And like we've done quite a bit like to get people around from different constituencies, like academia, like Miria said with IRSG and IRTF work and, and operators who come in as well. And so like we are trying really hard to reach out and you'd love to hear from people like uh, about your problems, come work with us collaboratively so we can solve things together. Because uh, as Lars said, the multi-stakeholder approach has really brought us this far and it'll take us further going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Shuresh. And right on time. Dhruv, you're up next. One to two minutes. Uh Thank you. Uh, I'm uh, speaking here from Bangalore, India. I started participating in ITF uh, as a software developer. So I was a consumer of RFCs for a long time. I have been reading RFCs, implementing them. And during that implementation process, you do realize that, oh, this feature is missing or something better can be done. And, oh, I wouldn't have done it in this way. This is stupid. Let me come and fix this. So that's how I got involved with my first uh, document. And I wrote an internet draft, came to the first document, luckily got support, but then kind of did, did realize that uh, it's not uh, like many people in my part of the world who are very active with RFCs, who read, who implement, but they never participate. They always thought of it as it's something somebody else does. And we are the software arm of the company and we are going to go and implement things, but somebody else does the actual standard development. And this I wanted to break uh, and with the help of, in fact, people like Suresh and other people, we, we started working within India, which has almost every MNC, every big vendor and huge operators in India, with, which managed really big networks. So started working with them and how we can increase participation from this part of the world. And over the years, yes, the participation has increasing, remote participation has helped a lot, but still there is a long way to go. And yes, the journey is not over. Uh, I am also the IAB outreach coordinator. I'm part of the education and outreach team uh, uh, in the ITF as well. So this is very important 
uh, for me as well. And I'm personally trying to put more and more effort in making ITF more accessible for people. I myself can see a lot of change has happened in the years that I started participating in, which is around 2010. So it's been a, a while now. And when new people come in, how we can make it easier for them to participate in ITF has been very important. And with various programs uh, as well, we have been doing it. As a non-binary person myself, making sure that the participation from women and, uh, uh, and uh, other uh, genders is as easy and as successful at ITF is also very key. And we have been focusing that, on that as well at ITF. Thank you. Thank you, Drew. That was really important to also note about the inclusion part. Um, Colin, you're up. One to two minutes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jane. Uh, my, my name is Colin Perkins. Uh, I work at the University of Glasgow in the UK. And I'm the current chair of the IRTF, the Internet Research Task Force. As Maria said earlier, the IRTF is a parallel organization to the IETF, uh, and we focus on longer-term research to, to complement the near-term standards work in the IETF. And we try to act as a bridge between the research community and the standards development community in the IETF. I've been involved in the IETF and the IRTF since the mid-1990s. Um, I had a, a somewhat similar experience to that of Lars when starting. Uh, I, I was doing research. Um, in my case, it was a multicast video conferencing rather than TCP. Um, and we, we brought some of the ideas into the, the IETF community uh, to try and uh, uh, get them standardized. Uh, and um, they you know, got a, a, a surprisingly, uh, for me at the time, uh, uh, Positive welcome. Uh, I, I, I thought this this would be a, a big and scary thing to do, but it turned out to be a surprisingly straightforward. Uh, and um, the ideas got some take up, and, and I got sucked into the process uh, and have been involved ever since. Uh, since then, I've continued to work on transport protocols, uh, both in the research community and in the ITF. Uh, I've chaired a number of IETF working groups. And for the last five years or so, I've been chairing the IRTF, uh, coordinating between the research and the standards communities uh, and looking into the, the dynamics of the IETF standards process. Thank you. Excellent. Maria, over to you. How have you engaged with the IETF in the past and what's your current work area of focus? So uh, I already talked a lot, so I will try to be very brief, and we have enough time later for questions. Um, my story is actually very similar. I'm, I also started as a PhD student, even working on TCP. <laughs> um, and the one thing I want to mention is that my first meeting was like very overwhelming. There's like so much things going on, and there's a lot of things that like you don't understand from the first minute, but that would be a wrong expectation. But the one thing that I, I felt at the very first meeting I went to, and whenever I engaged with the IETF, was that there's a lot of energy, there's a lot of things happening, and there's a lot of smart people, there's a lot of those people still there who kind of invented the internet or has, has been working on the very early protocols who have a lot of expertise, but also knowledge about the history and this whole spirit of like having a network to openly connect people and to exchange freely information that's still there. It was still there when I started and it is still there. And that is also, for me, the motivation why I keep engaging with the IETF beyond just my technical work, also taking over le leadership positions and why I'm sharing the IEB at the moment. Just to give you a little bit more uh, uh, background, I'm, I'm an engineer, I'm working for Ericsson. I'm still working on transport, not TCP anymore, but like a new fancy <laughs> transport protocol, so we're actually doing some work there. Um, and, and that's a large portion of my time. And, and then the other portion of my time is sharing the IAB. And again, that is not driving my company's interest forward, but it's driving the internet and the IETF forward. And I think this is really important. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. That's perfect. And Mallory, over to you. Yeah, last one to go to introduce. Um, yeah, I'm Mallory Nodal. I am um, work at the Center for Democracy and Technology, it's my day job. And um, I'm, as Miriam Mary mentioned, I'm on the um, Internet Architecture Board with Drew and Suresh. And um, also, um, I chair a research group on human rights. So uh, I guess a few other roles. Like I, I've chaired a, a working group with Suresh a little bit. Um, and I'm a reviewer for the general area. That's another thing that folks can do at the IETF is you can, you can review um, other people's work. You don't always have to be writing it. It's something that I found really valuable and helps me follow what's going on. Um, my, my first meeting was almost 10 years ago, surprisingly. It was 
um, when I was working at the Association for Progressive Communications, and I found it a really interesting place for two reasons. The first was that we were at APC at the time were really uh, fostering like implementation of technology, but not the way big tech does it. We were really tiny. Um, sometimes independent, sometimes NGOs that were either running community networks or um, web or email hosting. And so I found it really interesting to try to infuse those views and those experiences into the larger standards bodies, because I think it is often perceived as dominated by big tech, and the, the problem space is just so wildly different. So I, I found that interesting and useful. And then the second thing that um, I found really fascinating and impactful about it and why I've really stuck around all these years is um, for a while at APC and then in previous positions, I was a trainer for digital security for like journalists and activists and people who are really at risk in authoritarian regimes and um, during protests and things like that. And it's so hard to teach some of those concepts back then, like you know, PGP encrypted email. You could spend three days trying to teach journalists how to use it and they still would not always get it right. <laughs> and you were worried about their security and their, whether they understood their threat model and things like that. Um, and you still only trained like a handful of people after a week. Um, and at the IETF, what I thought was really interesting is you could um, actually maybe start, try to change the way the internet works for everyone so that you would have a lot more impact um, in keep, pe keeping people safe online and keeping them connected um, because the internet itself would, would change and meet those needs of the most at-risk people. Um, and so anyway, that's what I find really fascinating about um, working at the IETF level and um, yeah, looking for the discussion. So. Excellent. Um, there's a question I'll ask Lars now. And Lars, could you let us know what some of the hot topics are in the IETF that participants might want to learn more about? Um, if you could take two to three minutes on that one so that we can get a couple other questions in and then have open it up for Q&A. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, so there, there are obviously a lot of uh, things happening at the IETF. We have um, around 120 different working groups that work on different areas of, of the internet. Uh, uh, space. Um, and, and all of them are doing something, or most of them are doing something. Um, but I want to like maybe hit a on a few points. Um, so, so one of the, the current themes that, that have been uh, happening ever since the Snowden revelations over 10 years ago is that the ITF is really serious about strengthening the security of the internet and the privacy protections that, that users have. And, and we've done a lot of work there. Um, one of the core protocols in that space is TLS, the Transport Layer Security Protocol. Um, and we've uh, recently, I think uh, two years ago or something like that, published version 1.3 of TLS, which has um, significantly simplified the protocol um, and has uh, also added to the uh, security and privacy protections um, that, are, that are offered to users. And that is widely deployed now. Um, all major browsers, well, all browsers really implemented, um, all servers and CDNs implemented, and, and TLS 1.3 really has upped the, the game for, for online security. So that, that's a thing we recently did. Um, TLS 1.3 is also part of the QUIC protocol that you might have heard about, which is another thing that uh, the ITF has recently shipped. Uh, QUIC is um, not quite replacing TCP, but at least providing similar features um, in terms of data transport um, for uh, the new version of the HTTP uh, web protocol, which is HTTP version three. Um, and that is that is also a massive effort that um, I think by, by some counts, um, quick with HTTP three and TLS one three is already close to half of all web traffic um, within just a, a year or two or three after initial deployment. Um, so it, it, that illustrates that you know the work in the ITF sometimes takes a long time because it's complicated and we need to get it all correct, right? Because remember, maintaining the plane while while, while it's flying, right? So we don't want to we don't want to crash it. Um, but once once something is ready and if it solves a need, it can get global deployment very very quickly. Um, and so the internet is, is dramatically changing because of things the ITF is doing every day. Uh, and sometimes you know the the entire model of the internet traffic is changing from within a few months from like, you know, mostly HTTP2 with TCP and TLS 1.2 to now quick and TLS 1.3. So that is sort of 
demonstrates the, the, the power that the IETF really has in terms of driving change in the internet. Um, I want to maybe mention one last topic, which isn't, isn't quite in part of the sort of core set of internet protocols, but it's very important. So there's, an, there's a way in which the IETF starts new work um, when we don't have a working group that, that already you know, fits that, that proposal, which is called the Birds of a Feather Session. And we had one, um, uh, the acronym for it is DALT. Um, I must admit, I forget what the expansion is, but uh, never mind. The, the problem DALT is trying to solve is um, all of us now have like air tags and, and various other Bluetooth trackers, location trackers in our luggage or our backpacks or a keychain or a car or somewhere else. And uh, stalking through these devices is a huge problem, right? So, you, you know, um, air tags and other devices like that work great. Um, except when you know somebody slips you one of these things into your purse or into your car or somewhere else, and then they can track you. Um, and um, obviously, that is um, a very real threat model. We you know where people's personal privacy and and bodily <laughs> harm is at stake. Um, and Dalt is an example where the big vendors of these devices are are have tried to come together and have looked for a forum. Uh, for where they can all standardize on, you know, how can your Google Android phone alert you if someone has slipped you an Apple AirTag, right? Because they are two different ecosystems in terms of devices, but they need to cooperate uh, around the standard for making sure that your phone, your Android phone alerts you if somebody has slipped, you know, an AirTag into your purse, although it's an Apple device. Um, and the Security modeling and the solution space is very complicated, but it's very, very, very important given the vast amount of tags that are out there. And this is obviously just the beginning, right? Because um, the more tags are out, the, the you know better the tracking works and that enables new uses for yet more tags. Um, this is a new work. So there's not a um, ITF standard on it yet. Um, it's not even a working group yet, although it's very likely that by the meeting in Prague in, in two or three weeks, uh, will likely start a working group, but um, it, it demonstrates that the IETF is sort of a natural home for some of these um, technical areas that are sort of adjacent to the overall internet. Because I mean, these tracking networks become enabled because the internet exists. And so organizations that look for a home that has, you know, open participation, you know, where it's free to use the standards because, you know, we, we want everybody to be able to integrate this into their tracking networks, right? So we, we don't want to have a solution that requires somebody to pay revenues or, you know, pay membership fees so they can participate in the setting of the standard or deploying it. Um, and so they have chosen the ITF as a home because we have, you know, clear rules about how we do our work. Everybody understands them. Everybody understands you just participate uh, individually. There's no membership fees. There's no restrictions on the use of the outcome technology. Um, and we're hoping that that uh, will get deployment very widely as well once the technical work is done. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Lars. We're going to open it up for some Q&A in the room and online. Um, does anyone have any questions for any of our panelists about the IETF or the IRTF? Um, and Dhruv is our online moderator. And I, Dhruv, I don't see anything online. Do you? I might have missed something. No, none so far. OK, we have a question here in the room. Please, and if you could keep the question short so that we can give you a short answer. Sure. <laughs> yeah, hopefully this is on. Uh, Andrew, Andrew Kampling, um, uh, uh, I run a uh, public policy, public affairs consultancy, and I'm an ITF uh, enthusiast. Um, we sort of touched on, but haven't really expanded on diversity uh, in standards bodies. Um, when we consider diversity on whatever axis you like, whether it's ge uh, geographic, ethnicity, age, or gender, um, it, it's a big problem. Uh, so for example, the ITF is about 10% uh, female participation, um, to give uh, one example. It's not a multi-stakeholder process, so there's very limited involvement of CSOs, and those that do engage with a relatively narrow um, sort of perspective, uh, or represent re relatively narrow points of view, uh, governments and their agencies are largely not involved, um, and that equally end users 
uh, are, are not present. And as uh, I think Andrew mentioned, uh, the tech sector representation is pretty narrow, so we don't have many network operators, for, for example. If we accept that diversity of, improves the culture of an organization and the quality of its output, uh, what are the unintentional barriers to both entry and to ongoing participation that, that affect uh, that diversity and how can we fix them um, so that we get much better diversity of thought and therefore better standards? So Andrew, I'm going to ask you to answer that question and could you do that in about a minute to two minutes? Yeah, sure. Um, Andrew, the diversity question is always an interesting one for me and we've had some quite extensive debates about this at the IETF. I think you've got to look at it as what does diversity mean in the context of the IETF? Because I think that it goes so much deeper than when you start looking at what I would consider your standard diversity metrics of gender, race, et cetera. It comes down to what is the diversity of technical thought and bringing that into the IETF. Um, for example, I think that sitting here in Africa, I bring an African perspective, which is diverse. And I think that to say that the IETF is also not a multi-stakeholder engagement model, I think that that's actually fundamentally inaccurate because there is a lot of multi-stakeholder. You have the operators, you have the vendors, and the participation is open for anybody to come and participate. Be you an operator, be you a vendor, be you a government. I know that I've done a lot of presentations to various government entities saying we need more involvement from Africa. It's about encouraging people to come. But I would definitely say that the IETF is a multi-stakeholder organization, and we welcome that participation and actively encourage it. But I think on the diversity question, as I said, it comes down to how do you define the diversity? And for me, that diversity is about bringing cultures. It's about bringing different perspectives, different views from different segments of the industry, et cetera. And in that sense, I actually think the IETF is, it has a lot of diversity in that sense. We could do better, but I do think that it is there. So I hope that helps. Thank you, Andrew. We're gonna turn it over to Miria, but I would also wanna just uh, put out there for those of you that may not know this, um, there is a policymakers group where I saw, I saw funds that, um, and you've brought people from all over the world, from the governmental sector, from parliamentarians and others. It's a quiet group. They 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 meet with different people from the IETF and the IAB and the IRTF. And I would just say that there's probably more going on on a multi-stakeholder level than some people would know. Miria, over to you. Yes, I, I would like to add uh, um, quickly a few points. And one point is that we totally understand actually engaging actively in the IETF in is needs resources, right? And the IETF is also depends on these resources. We don't have staff members who are working on the standards, actually the participants that voluntarily come to the IETF and do all the work. So if you want to engage on that level, that is a big commitment. And we totally understand that, that not even in the private sector, everybody can afford that. But on the other hand, it's also, we have, it's important to have like a certain diversity in order to ensure quality of our standards and then make sure everybody, even those people who had, didn't have the resources to participate in the creation of the standards can freely use the standards and can engage if they want to enhance the standards. And, uh, and this is a really important point where it's not only about bringing people and taking the pen up, but reaching out and making sure people are aware about what we're doing. And that's something we try to do a lot more, including um, with policy stakeholders where we try to reach out and, 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 and have a dialogue and try to explain what we're doing, how it works, where touch points are, also bridging this information back into the IETF. So, um, so the, 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 there are challenges in, in like active participation, but I think to have a dialogue and to understand the requirements, we also need other ways um, to do that. 
Thank you, Mary, and thank you for your question. It was an important question. Um, someone else in the room who has a question, please. Uh, okay, voila. Uh, Dinesh, please. Hi, um, my name is Dinesh. I'm from Bangalore, India, and working in a rural area. So my question is a little bit of segue, but I'm starting with Maria. Maria, right? So <laughs> no, no, her. Uh, okay. Mallory. Yeah. Mal Both Mallory. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> so what you, um, what you said, like you're coming from APC background, yeah. and then you're coming from web background, mm -hmm. and then you're doing I IETF standards. My question for the whole conference has been in almost everywhere I've been, why is not anybody working on web standards, extending it to the communities out there? Is the internet done? You know, when it comes to web protocols, web standards and all that, we need to push it. That's what I'm kind of trying to say. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, the World Wide Web Consortium is um, largely responsible for the web standards, right, W3C. It would be great to have the W3C at the IGF more, I think. Um, as someone who also engages there, my organization is really invested in um, the web standards, a, a variety of different standards that aren't just about you know uh, the web and, and all the other ways that it faces the users more. Um, I think yeah, it would be great to have to have them more. So it's not necessarily a question for the IETF. There is some degree of overlap, right, between what happens there, and we also have an established IETF has an established liaison. Or no, do we have an established yes, liaison? We do. It. We have an established liaison relationship with the W3C. Yeah, that's what I was worried about. We had a recent conversation in which that has confused me. But no, and, and so that's important, and that happens already. Um, but in fact, yeah, it would be great to, in the IGF, which I think is mostly seen as a policy space, to actually have this bridging role where the technical community comes as well. So while this is our first, the IETF's first time doing an open forum, we know ICANN has done one for a while, we know ISOC has been involved, maybe we can convince W3C to come next time as well. Uh, and just to follow up very, very briefly on that, uh, Lars mentioned HTTP3, uh, which is the next version of the, the Web Transport Protocol, which was developed in the, the ITF very recently. Um, and in uh, collaboration with the, the W3C, we also uh, did the, the, uh, the, the WebRTC protocols for, for video conferencing, uh, which uh, I think we've all uh, put a lot of effort into uh, over the last few years with the pandemic. Yeah, as a follow-up on, on that, John from the Air Foundation, um, the main difference would be the, um, uh, the membership system that they have in W3C. So participation is quite more difficult unless you can actually afford the fees. So there has to be a more reflection on how to proceed with that. Thanks. Thank you. Over to you. Uh, thank you. Uh -huh. I actually have a comment, not a question, but uh, my name is Dan Kujevitovic from Icon Board. And uh, I would first like to forward uh, the best from our chair, Tripti Sinha, but she's on a bilateral, so could be here. And thank the AAB for sending uh, Harold to us. I think he says always his role is to protect us from breaking the internet. So he's very good at that, and thank you. Uh, but most of all, thank you for the standards you're making and your work on privacy. This is the key uh, underpinning of the technical layer that we are all, all working on together. I still remember uh, my reading of the first RFC that was SMTP protocol when we were trying uh, to connect in Serbia uh, BBS system to internet to exchange our emails and writing code to read that. And for me personally, that was a, a shock how easy it was to read that document and how enabling that was to, to, to help on the internet. So I can obviously support IITF and uh, your specific multi-stakeholder model. And uh, we often uh, looking at the whole ecosystem of standard organizations. Sometimes there is discussion also about uh, standards that are developed uh, inside different organizations. But for me, it's the clear that IITF is the key uh, for the technical layer of the internet. And the strength is uh, the openness and free, uh, free standards that are uh, based on IP and voluntarily accepted. Uh, so this is kind of the uh, reason for the win of open networks of, uh, against closed systems. And we often hear, even uh, in the... Um, 
IGF and other fora about ideas for changing the basic protocols in the kind of old ITU style way of thinking. But I think uh, given this uh, uh, tremendous success of the internet, it's clear that the way how ITF is doing is the way forward. And we are grateful for that. Keep on doing it and we support you. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you very much for what you do on the ICANN board. Is there anyone else? Okay, lovely. We've got about two more questions in the, we've got five minutes. So if you have a minute to ask it, we'll get a minute to answer it and see what we can do. Uh, this is Ignacio Castro from Queen Mary University of London, and I chair, uh, and I chair a research group at the uh, IRTF. Uh, I've heard quite a few times here that uh, certain groups are not represented in the technical community, but to be frank, I have been quite surprised to see how little representation of the technical community is in the IGF, and I'm wondering what would be the way to bridge that gap, because it looks like uh, both communities are seeing exactly the same problem on uh, the other side. I'll just quickly say I couldn't agree with you more. There was more participation in the beginning 10 to 15 years, and it's been, and this is one of the reasons the IETF, IEB, RERTF is here today and has this great session, and I think you'll see more in the future. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. No, I just wanted to say that, that um, I think there's a recognition of that, and um, it's certainly something that uh, every, everyone I feel like I've spoken to today and this week from the technical community, even those that aren't here, RERs and, and others are aware of and think there's a, a concerted effort now to, to shift that back to where it used to be, like Jane said. Um, I do want to acknowledge the point you make about challenges because this forum is also very broad. I found it very interesting to be here. I learned a lot also, like just like for me personally, caring about the internet as a citizen, but identifying um, the, the parts of the discussion where we can provide valuable input is challenging for us. You know, and that's a really good point, Miria. We may want to see if we can talk to the MAG or make more input on a technical track, right? which because we used to come and do internet exchange points, BGP, a little bit of IP addressing, so maybe we bring that back. We have room for one more question if you ask it quickly. I don't see any, oh, bravo, go ahead. Uh, my name is Makoto Nakamura from the local government of uh, Nara City, Japan. Uh, I have, now I have fight against uh, legacy technology or legacy people. And uh, uh, today's government system in Japan often use the FTP, still use the FTP or old protocols. Would you have any idea to quit the old protocol or legacy protocol into the trash? Uh, I know that the RFG back the absolute, I know, but it's a replacement of the new uh, protocol almost all of six uh, cases. So how would you step up or move to new technology? and push from the IETF? This is my first question. So, I mean, uh, gladly, even so, these old protocols are still there, the internet doesn't break, so that's part of the architecture, and that's the good news. Um, I think uh, a lot of these protocols, like there has been a lot of focus on, on security, for example, um, and sometimes that's unfortunately a harder selling point than performance. You know, if you have a protocol which gives you direct benefits that like shows your investment on a short term and pays back, then it's easy to convince people. If you if you have to update to a new protocol and you have invest uh, have to invest money, manpower, knowledge, um, and and you and you don't get a direct payback, um, that's a challenge. But um, yeah, I think we need to just go and explain the importance of updating these protocols and the impact on the long term to keep the internet healthy and to protect your own services you're providing by getting a more reliable, more secure, and, and a better network. So I think it's it's an education ta task for us all, and I, I understand the challenge. There's also just another shout out to ISOC. I used to work there, I don't work there now, just a disclaimer. <laughs> but there's a really strong Japanese chapter, ISOC chapter, and they may be able to do some workshops with you. Thank They're really great. Um, I think we're at time, and um, I think it's time to just say thank you to everybody for participating. For everyone in the room, everyone online, thank you, Drew, for being the online moderator, and everyone else here. So give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you very much, and stay in touch with the IETF IAB. Thank you.